Hello um, everyone and welcome to the Mentor More Cymru virtual conference. Um, Croes y Cynnes i'r Cynhadledd Mentor More Cymru. Uh, my name is Melanie Cargill and I'm the manager of the Mentor More Cymru project. Um, and this session, which is the first of our webinars today, um, is looking at where the pork sector is heading in 2021. Um, so we're really delighted to have Mick Sloyan join us uh, to deliver this webinar. Um, Mick is an industry analyst with over 40 years experience of working in the industry um, and he was, a, was the first uh, CEO for BPEX and became the first sector director at AHDB uh, following its creation in 2008. Um, Mick's contribution to the British big industry was recognised in 2018 when he was awarded the David Black Award and uh, Mick retired from his role in AHDB in 2018, but he remains heavily involved in the industry as an me uh, independent meat industry analyst. So we're really delighted to have Mick share some of his knowledge on the sector and his predictions for the year ahead. Um, very briefly before I pass you on to Nick, uh, Mick, uh, just to make you aware that there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of, of Mick's presentation, um, so you're encouraged to ask any questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you're welcome to ask the questions in English or Welsh, um, and we'll do our very best uh, towards the end to try and answer as many as we possibly can. So now I'm going to hand you straight over to Mick, so welcome Mick. Well, thanks, Melanie, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the the invitation to, uh, to be able to, uh, to present to you today. I'll just uh, get the presentation up, and uh, there we are. I hope everybody can see that. And uh, all right, let's uh, let's make a start. So as, uh, as Melanie said, um, what I'd like to do is to talk about where I think the, uh, the pork sector is gonna be heading this year. And uh, the items I'd like to cover is just a, a quick look at pig prices and where we are with those at the moment. And then some of the things that have been driving the market along. So they include uh, African swine fever and COVID-19 and the impact that they've been having both on demand and supply. Uh, a few comments about the feed market, because that's actually uh, going to have a significant bearing on profitability. Uh, a few comments on Brexit, uh, although luckily not as many as I may have had, had we not got to a deal. Um, and then what does it all mean for the profitability of pig producers in Wales? Uh, before I then reach some sort of uh, conclusions uh, at the end. So in terms of pig prices, uh, I find this, uh, this graph is, is probably the most uh, helpful in terms of uh, relativities. The, uh, the UK line, uh, this is the EU reference price. It's a, a, a method uh, when we were in the EU of being able to, to produce prices on a comparable basis, or at least as, a, as, as comparable as, as we could do. So it's not, it's not the same as the, uh, the SPP, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's not far off. And, and you see a couple of things here. So back in, in uh, 2019, you'll have seen we were operating at a premium over this EU average, which is the, the kind of gray line here. And then uh, during the course of, uh, of 2019 and into the early part of 2020, we saw a very rapid rise in, in average EU prices. Uh, we also saw quite a bit of volatility, as you can sort of see here. And a lot of that was associated with uh, demand, particularly from China, which I'll talk about. Uh, but of course, then once we got into 2020, we started to see a, a various impacts. Uh, COVID-19 actually came in, and we'll, we'll look at that in some kind of detail. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, African swine fever and the impact that that's had. So what I'll try and do is, is, is pull out all of the, the key factors, uh, the key drivers uh, that have had a, a, an impact on that. But what I would point out is, is a couple of things. One is that prices generally in, in this country are much more stable than we see in the rest of Europe. So you can see a, a, a lot of volatility going on there. And that's mostly associated with the way that, that pigs are priced in this country. 
uh, most pigs sold on, I mean, most pigs, virtually all pigs sold as a direct deadweight sale between producers and, and, and abattoirs. Uh, and a lot of those actually sold on contract formulas. So, and, and those vary, the kind of things that go into them vary a lot, but you'll see that, that what that gives it is a very stable or a much more stable profile uh, and development than we see, let's say in, in Europe where uh, they still will trade in some cases, if you take France, for example, they have an auction uh, twice a week. Uh, and so that gives them much more volatile prices. Um, and uh, as a consequence, if you like, um, we tend to see these slightly differing trends. The second thing is, and as I've said, we saw it in 2019, but we're, we've seen it again, is that whilst UK prices are being influenced by the EU and are certainly having an, an impact on, on pulling down our market, because of this, this less volatility in our marketplace, we tend to see our prices moving much less quickly or, or slower than the rest of the EU, which gives us quite a substantial premium. Uh, as I say, these prices are as comparable as they can be. Uh, but as you can see, for probably certainly the second half uh, of last year and, and into this current year, we're, we're managing to maintain a premium over the rest of the EU, currently around about 30 pence a kilo. Uh, now, you know, premiums are relative, not absolute. So yes, our prices are falling and that's going to have an impact on profitability, which I'll talk about. But it could be an awful lot worse uh, if we were, were dragged down to, to EU levels, uh, then that would have quite a serious impact uh, on, our, on our business. But at the moment, we're, we're holding that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about how I think that premium will develop uh, over the course of, uh, of this year. So what, what's driving the market? Well, there's a number of, uh, of different factors, COVID-19. Uh, be the first one. That's had an impact, but on both on the supply and the demand side of, of the market, which is uh, a little unusual. Uh, I know you're going to be talking, uh, there's a, a session uh, coming straight after my presentation, uh, looking at consumer demand, so I won't go into it in any detail. But what's actually happened is that COVID has actually, in terms of its impact on the, on the market, uh, has been generally beneficial. And the reason for that is that, that what we've seen is a switch from retail, uh, from food service demand into retail. Now, in certain sectors of the market, particularly on things like beef, that, that's been a, a, a problem because there's quite a high penetration of, of sales in the food service sector. As far as we're concerned in, in this country, because we have a relatively low uh, market share, if you like, of, of the food service market, and we have a high share of the retail market, uh, then what that's meant is that as, as retail sales have picked up, then actually that's been a disproportionate benefit to home produced pork and pork products. Uh, and it's, it's, it's had a, a weakening effect on imports. Uh, because imports were, uh, were more favoured in the food service market. Obviously, you still see them at retail, but, but they had a disproportionate uh, market share within food service. So that's been quite good. And, and the numbers have been quite dramatic, as they have been over uh, much of the, the retail business. And uh, uh, data from uh, Kantar quoted by uh, AHDB, if you take the whole of 2020, so that includes two or three months uh, before COVID really hit, you can see that we've seen volume sales up by 8% and spend by 15%. Um, and when you consider that usually changes in, in retail volumes are matters of, of one, one and a half percent a year, those would be big movements. So this represents quite a big shift uh, in the, the move from food service into retail. And as I've said, generally uh, has been a, a benefit and has, has helped uh, certainly to maintain demand for domestic produced pork. But COVID has also had an impact on the supply chain. And, and what that 
has been mainly is because of temporary closures of, of abattoirs and particularly boning plants within abattoir, uh, which tend to be rather uh, very kind of labor intensive. And obviously when you look at things like, like boning lines, you've got a lot of people in, in, a, in an area with a, a generally cold climate, which, which is good for, uh, for viruses. Uh, and so, you know, although a lot of measures have been taken uh, to try and, uh, and maintain biosecurity within the abattoirs themselves, obviously people are coming in from, from the general uh, population uh, where we've seen, you know, the virus in circulation. So it's hardly surprising that we get some outbreaks of, uh, within abattoir workers. Uh, and that's led to both a reduction in throughput, uh, just in terms of the amount of time that you've got uh, to bone uh, carcasses, but also uh, obviously, you know, it's led to closures, temporary closures, uh, you know, every now and again. That, that's had quite a knock on effect back on farm. Uh, and it's made, uh, has contributed quite a lot to, uh, to a big rise in carcass weight. Um, although farmers are doing a good job to, uh, to try and maintain um, the fatness levels. Uh, and the numbers are, are, quite, you know, are, are quite stark. We've, we've seen in recent years a gradual uptick in, in average carcass weights. And they usually, it's usually about half a kilo, maybe a kilo a year. Um, I was looking at the latest uh, figures uh, from AHDB, and they're showing an average carcass weight, cold carcass weights now for, uh, uh, for pigs in this country, uh, are nearly 91 kilos they were last week. Uh, and that's up from 85 and a half kilos a year ago. Uh, but interestingly, uh, average P2s, average fatness, um, they've gone up a bit, but they've only, over that year period, they've only gone up from about 11.3 millimeters to 11.5. So people are doing a, a good job uh, in terms of uh, trying to manage fatness, although it is very, very difficult. And the number of egg grades you're gonna get at the top end of, of the weight range is a, is a concern, uh, particularly when you're getting up to those kind of weights and those levels of fatness. So it has had quite a big impact. And as I'll, I'll discuss in a minute, it's also had an impact on export uh, because of COVID has had a big impact on, on exports. Obviously the outlook for, for 2021 for this year, Depends on, on how quickly the pandemic is brought under control. Uh, I think there's a, there's a general level of hope everywhere uh, that we will see um, the rollout of the vaccine program uh, and that will, will help to, to reduce and suppress the disease uh, or the pandemic. Um, and that in turn will help to, uh, to make sure that we can return to a reasonable uh, level of, of operation, certainly on the supply side, there should be far less disruption uh, coming through there. Um, the disease of, of pigs this time, rather than people, um, African swine fever has been the big driver for the last two and a half years, uh, certainly on the global market. And uh, it's, it's the outbreak that uh, really, uh, it started in Europe, uh, it rolled its way through Asia, but it was when it hit China that it had the, the biggest impact. And uh, to try and put that into some sort of perspective, you can see there between 2018 and 2020, Chinese pork production is estimated to have fallen by between about 13, and 13 to 16 million tons. Uh, numbers do vary uh, and estimates do vary. Um, but I would say it's probably nearer the 13 or 14 million than the 16 million. But to put that into some sort of perspective, um, EU production in total, is about 16 million tons a year or just over. So in the space of those two year period, of that two year period, we've seen an enormous fall in the amount of, of pork produced in China. And of course, pork is, the, is by far the most popular meat in China. And that's led in turn to an enormous increase in imports, um, imports of pork, but also imports of other protein uh, to try and, and, and fill the gap that's actually come through. And of course, that in turn has had a knock on impact, uh, and a, a initially a, a beneficial impact uh, in our market. So EU export volumes, which were running really quite high, uh, and, and we were seeing unprecedented, unprecedented levels of export right through until around about September of last year. But that, was, that got hit uh, by an outbreak of, of ASF in Germany in September. 
and that's uh, uh, whilst that outbreaks in in wild boars uh, or, or feral pigs uh, and not in commercial herds, that hasn't stopped the suspension of those exports into China. And uh, I've used the term there, regionalization or compartmentalization, you can, you can call it that. And, and just to explain what happens when you have an outbreak like that, uh, let's say within the EU, is uh, you see control measures put in place, uh, you see uh, sort of circles of, of control uh, put in, uh, and nothing from within those uh, those geographical areas, the smaller geographical areas, can, can go for export. However, uh, it's accepted within the EU that outside of those areas where the, where the outbreaks occur and where the control measures are in place, it's accepted that, that they can continue to trade um, because it's deemed that there's there's no risk. And it, if you want an example, uh, Poland, which has been suffering from from ASF now for three, four years, uh, is still able to trade around uh, trade pork within the EU from those areas, outside those areas in Poland that are not affected. Um, and in fact, it can trade outside of the EU as well. Some countries accept uh, the, the assurances that they are given uh, that pork produced, uh, commercial pork especially, uh, produced outside those areas is safe. Uh, however, China does not. Uh, and it's, it's always had that policy and so uh, you will either see a voluntary suspension or you will see the Chinese um, actually introduce bans on, on imports from all over the, from the whole of Germany uh, as they have done from uh, uh, the Baltic states. Now that was particularly important uh, in relation to Germany because Germany was the second largest, or in fact was the largest exporter to China. Uh, of fresh meat and of offal. And uh, to give you some sort of sense of, of scale, uh, the Germans were heading towards, uh, in 2020, heading towards exporting 800,000 tons of uh, pork to, uh, to China. That's about the same as our total production in a year within the United Kingdom. So you can see that the, the impact has been huge. And what that means is now Germany has to try and, and find somewhere else to send that pork, uh, either uh, to other EU countries, which is what it's doing at the moment, or trying to eat more within its own market. But of course, uh, the only thing that's really gonna stimulate uh, consumption in those areas is lower prices. The, uh, uh, the other element to it as well is that uh, a tremendous amount of value was put into the market because the, the Germans exported, the Germans along with other EU exporters, uh, exported an awful lot of offal um, and, and other parts of the pig, generally described as bottom of the fifth quarter. Um, they exported uh, an enormous quantity uh, and that, that put a lot of value into the pig price. And what you saw as a consequence was that uh, the consequence of this ban is that they now do not have a market for that. And it's very difficult to find markets for that, certainly within Europe. And so that value is more or less disappeared. Uh, and that's been reflected in, in downward pressure on, on prices in Germany. And that in turn has had an impact uh, on the rest of the EU. Uh, and I'm afraid the prospects of Germany getting back into China in, in 2021 are very slim. Uh, we are seeing uh, new cases occur all in wild bull, uh, admittedly, but either close to uh, the, the Polish border or, or not far from it. Um, and as long as that happens, uh, I think the, the Chinese are unlikely to accept regionalization, although, of course, the Germans are trying to, uh, to push that. So I, I'm afraid we're, we're going to be stuck with that as a trend for some time. Why China has been important, um, and, and some people might find this graph surprising, but uh, it, it, what's been happening in China in terms of that, that reduction has been a, a, an enormous increase in prices. And... Um, uh, some people might not believe this, but it's true. Uh, these are converted uh, prices that they, uh, the Chinese uh, sell their pigs on a live weight basis. And I've converted them at around about 80% killing out because obviously the offal has quite a big value. But you can see there from back in, in sort of really the start or the uh, as we moved in the end of, of 2018 and into 2019, as that reduction in, in production came through, 
uh, you saw this huge increase. And their previous market, which was a running around about 190 200 to 200 pence a kilo dead weight, is now nearly at, at, at five quid a kilo. And so, you know, in comparison to our prices in the 140s, that is, that is huge. And you see, it's been quite volatile. And uh, we'll talk in a moment about what's happening in, in China in terms of uh, getting back into the market. But you've seen this volatility at a generally high level at over, th these are 30 RMB, so that's a kind of taken as a benchmark. Of late, uh, prices have been going up, but they tend to at this time of year anyway, because of the Chinese New Year, uh, which, which tends to, to cause a lot of stimulus for that. The other thing that's pushed their prices along has been the fact that um, they have been uh, uh, testing all imported frozen products, whether that be pork or any other meat, for the presence of, of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, uh, COVID and that in turn, I think, and it's been pretty widely publicized, and they now have a situation where uh, I think a lot of their retailers, I've seen reports their retailers are putting up certificates to say that they've tested this frozen uh, pork, which is in, invariably imported uh, for COVID. And of course, what that's tended to do is put, it puts a, a question into the minds of consumers about the safety of imported product against domestic product. So uh, what's happened is that the Chinese government have been trying to encourage a recovery in pig production. Um, and particularly, they, they're looking to replace what were small and, and almost backyard operations with large scale, uh, almost industrial. Uh, size, as I'll show you in a moment, was one or two examples of that. And, and, and despite that, uh, despite the presence of, of African swine fever, uh, admittedly, there hasn't been an outbreak. Well, there wasn't up until uh, the week before last. Uh, there hadn't been for a, for a few months. Uh, I think it's going to be accepted that it's in their wild boar population, uh, that it's, it's endemic in that regard. But despite that, considerable investment's already taken place. And it's, it's partly to do with government encouragement, but it's also to do with the fact that at those kind of prices, the equivalent to us of about five quid a kilo, it is immensely profitable to be producing pigs in China at the minute. Um, uh, numbers vary, but I saw one report that said that the Chinese uh, were making anywhere up to 70 to 75 pounds of pound sterling per pig produced. Uh, so that's um, hugely profitable. And, uh, and so it's hardly surprising that they're investing and taking the risk against that. Um, it's very clear that Chinese production is recovering. And I think that uh, uh, it's all about the speed at which that will happen. Um, and as a consequence, they're going to be importing less. And I think the prices that they're prepared to pay in 2021 will be lower. So we'll still see volume going out there, but I think the, the returns that we're, the, the, Certainly, EU producers uh, and possibly from, well, and all other producers from around the world that are shipping uh, will be will be lower. And as I've said, importers are also having tremendous difficulties. Um, the Chinese now require that all import packaging and that all containers are, are disinfected, uh, and that's causing a huge amount of disruption as well as undermining demand. And just to give you some idea, for those of you that uh, that saw Pig World in in December, you will have seen this. Um, so this is uh, Mu Yuan Foods, who are uh, probably now will seem to be the biggest um, the pig producer. This is one farm that they are in the process of building at the moment. Uh, as you can see, multi-story buildings, uh, and they're aiming that this one farm will hold 84,000 sows on a farrow to finish operation, uh, producing around about two million slaughter pigs a year. And uh, if you want to put that in some sort of perspective, that's about one fifth of the entire UK pig breeding herd just in that farm alone. So you can see the, the, the levels of investment are huge uh, and that, that production will start coming through quite quickly. Uh, China's also having an impact on global feed costs. And what we've seen is that uh, because they're moving from uh, effectively a kind of um, lower tech uh, production, which probably relied a lot on, on domestically produced uh, um, food material, because they're moving to large scale operations with, um, with a lot of compound feed in it. 
They're now uh, buying uh, raw material uh, on the world market, both in the shape of maize and soya, in order to jack up their, their compound food output to service all of these larger firms that they're, or large farms that they're now producing. And when you combine that with uh, poor weather in South America uh, and uh, uh, government policies in, in, in some areas like Argentina and, and Russia, where they have kind of export bans, uh, that they're all combining to reduce the supply of grains and oil seeds at a time when you're seeing an increase uh, in demand being driven by China. Uh, and it's, uh, th that's having a, a, a really tough time as far as our feed costs are concerned. Uh, adequate look this morning. If you're looking at feed wheat um, delivered uh, in, in the next month or two, it's up over 214 pound a tonne or thereabouts. Uh, in this country. Um, oil seeds up around about 380, high pro soya uh, up over 420. Um, so, you know, really, really high prices. Um, the one, um, uh, if you like, uh, encouragement uh, is that um, certainly on the feed wheat side, their new season prices uh, still high, uh, but down in the 160s for feed wheat. Uh, so certainly worth looking at in terms of uh, your own uh, situation and particularly whether you've got feed cover or not. Uh, as I've said, yeah, these are the, the ones themselves. If you, if you haven't got feed cover, um, then um, obviously you, you're going to be suffering the consequences. Uh, if you had it already, then that's probably done you some, uh, some good. And um, as I've said, the outlook uh, is, for, uh, is for some reduction. Uh, moderating a new harvest year, but, uh, but that's, that's certainly worth keeping an eye on uh, going forward. So what does all this mean for profitability? Uh, these are the, uh, uh, this is uh, some numbers that are produced by, uh, by AHDV. Uh, these are net margins on, on finishing pigs. Worth explaining a little bit about this. Um, these are based on a full economic cost. And what I mean by that is that uh, the assumption is made that uh, uh, all buildings are new and are fully de are, are then depreciated over the life of the building and in fact the same for, for all assets. Um, so it represents quite rightly uh, the full cost of producing a pig but it, it doesn't represent the cash cost and I think that's, that's going to be uh, important and I'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, these figures are, are quoted uh, by AHDV with the exception of this last quarter which has not been published yet. That's my estimate. Of where I think we are. So obviously, anything above the line is a is a net a positive net margin. Uh, anything below the line is is a loss. And as you can see here, I mean, it's not unusual for the big sector. I've gone back to 2017. You can see periods of reasonably good profitability. In fact, in, in 2017, very good profitability. Um, that leveled out into into 2018 uh, and the early part of 2019, where we started to see uh, some pressure, but with the increase in the market that we saw coming through, firstly in Europe, and that pulled the rest of, of, of that pulled up the UK market. And you can see it's been a pretty good run all the way through uh, in the, uh, the sort of second half of 2019 and 2020, certainly up until the last quarter, where we saw the decline in price. And the assumption I'm making here is that you were, that people were buying their feed on a spot basis, uh, hence the reason for the reduction of the margin. Obviously, if you had forward cover, then that number is going to be a lot smaller than that. Um, the reason I've, I've tried to draw out the distinction is that you uh, between um, full economic cost and cash cost. Yes, you're still losing money, but it's when it's when you go cash negative that life starts to get really, really difficult because obviously you haven't got enough money keeping it coming in to actually pay your bills. Um, so that's why it's kind of uh, significant. Um, it does vary depending on the, on the amount of, of uh, if you like, of, of non-cash costs that are in there. So things like depreciation, particularly. Um, but it's probably around about twelve pounds a pig, something like that, at the minute. So it's kind of down here. Um, so at the moment, uh, people hopefully uh, should be, and, uh, and on average, uh, should be uh, reasonably cash positive. Uh, but that's something that's really got to be kept an eye on as we go through 2021 
because generally speaking, what, what kills most businesses is the lack of cash, uh, not just the lack of profitability. Uh, very briefly on, on, on Brexit, as I've said, this could have been a lot longer uh, had we not had a deal, uh, but it was done. So we're maintaining tariff and, and quota free trade. Um, there, ha there are and some extra costs of, uh, of doing business. Um, and in particular, uh, the, the start of the, um, uh, the export, uh, sorry, in order to export, you need what's called an export health certificate. We've had to do that to non-EU countries for many, many years. Uh, we now have to do that when we export uh, across the channel. The arrangement the UK government came with, decided unilaterally was that it, it would not look to um, inspect paperwork uh, on fresh meat until the 1st of April or on, on fresh produce until the 1st of April. Uh, the same was not agreed uh, with the EU. So they've been making, they've been doing their checks straight away and that has led to uh, some delays at ports on our exports, not on our imports. Uh, and that is adding considerable costs and disruption. And where that's been shown up has been on uh, the same market. So coal sale prices have, have, have more or less collapsed in, in recent weeks. It's partly to do with the fact that prices in Germany have already fallen because of ASF. Um, if you looked at the German price on its own in euros, uh, that's down about 50%. So it's about half the level it was because there's a huge amount of manufacturing meat, obviously on the German market. Uh, but we're also seeing this disruption coming in as a consequence of, of, of us leaving uh, the EU. In the longer term, uh, of course, Brexit isn't just about our relationship with the EU, it's about our relationship with other countries. And uh, I think uh, a major challenge in probably future years rather than months will be the trade deals that we agree with other countries. Uh, most notably in our particular case, those who are large producers of pork, such as the USA, uh, Canada, and Brazil. And uh, it, it, a lot will come down to the standards that are applied on imports. And um, uh, the government are making some, some good noises about the fact that they want to preserve our standards. Uh, I think that in terms of, um, if you like, the sanitary standards, so in other words, the levels of meat inspection, uh, the use of uh, hormones, uh, or other chemicals such as uh, paline, uh, in the case of, um, of the US. Uh, I think probably the UK government will, will stand uh, on to its word on that one. Uh, I am much less confident uh, that when it comes to welfare standards, uh, that they'll write those into trade deals. Um, it's never been done uh, to my knowledge. Uh, and in fact, we probably had an opportunity with the, uh, with the EU uh, trade deal. Uh, to insist that all imports actually met our standards, particularly in relation to uh, the use of, uh, of sale stalls. Uh, but of course, that was, uh, that was missed. So in conclusion, uh, the uh, um, big section of Wales um, <clears throat> has been driven by factors uh, uh, and a collection of unprecedented factors. I've never seen them in, in 40 odd years. Uh, and it, in that they're affecting both demand and supply. Uh, at the same time. Um, obviously, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenge to everybody in society, and, and, and we've passed some very sad landmarks in, in recent days. But the one positive for the, for the sector is that it's increased retail demand for, for pork products produced in this country. Um, we, we only have a market share of about 50% uh, in, for our own products on sale in this country. So anything that uh, that helps to boost and bolster that is good, and it, 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 if that's the market you're in, if you're if you're selling locally, then I think uh, that's been beneficial and, and probably will continue to be beneficial for some time. China will continue to be influential on the market. Uh, it was influential in bolstering profits uh, across the EU, prices and profits across the EU, uh, and in the UK. Uh, what you're now gonna see uh, is uh, a bit of the reverse, I'm afraid. That recovery and modernization are, are gonna, uh, recovery is gonna reduce import demand. That's gonna put pressure on, on the pig price. And modernization is having an impact on feed costs. And certainly for this current year, I think that will be the, that will be the case. And Brexit's only having a, a minor impact, uh, but 
um, uh, it's having a major impact on, on coal sale prices uh, and returns from that. But longer term, I think we need to keep an eye on, on what deals or the, the basis on which what deals are made with, the, uh, with other countries as we seek to, uh, to expand our trading relationships around the world. Uh, it's going to be a tough year uh, for pig producers, um, but there are some positive signs. Uh, we, we're maintaining that price premium. Uh, I think there's, there's every chance we may not be able to maintain it at quite the level we've got at the minute at over 30 pence a kilo, because that's quite a lot. Um, and particularly when there's a lot of cheap meat around uh, in Europe. But I think we can certainly maintain a premium, uh, which is going to be which is going to be helpful. Uh, there are opportunities for locally produced. Um, I say locally produced and promoted. I mean, obviously, if you're producing it locally, but nobody knows that it's produced locally, then that's uh, you're not going to get uh, the most you'll get out of it. Out of it. Um, so people need to know that it is produced, and uh, especially in retail. And as the food service market comes back, uh, I think. If uh, you've got a local market in food service, pubs, restaurants, etc., um, then I think that's a, uh, that's a, could be a valuable market as well. But in all my experience, uh, as I said over forty years, um, managing through tough times is is part of the pig producer. Um, it used to be said that pigs were all muck or all money. Uh, maybe that's not quite the case; it's the same case as it used to be. But the industry generally is used to that. Um, and I know from, from Entermark, there's opportunities uh, to get good business advice uh, to help people manage through this, because if you can manage through these times, uh, then you're going to be in a far better position uh, when the market turns again. Uh, I'll just repeat again, what I would do is, is keep an eye on cash flow, because that is the real thing. You, you, you may be in a position as producers where uh, you can see a, a, a the light at the end of the tunnel, let's say, towards the back end of this year, if, if the markets go in the, go in the right direction. But if you run out of cash, then you won't be able to, be, to, to benefit that. So keep an eye on your cash flow. Uh, you know, talk to the bank manager, the accountant. Um, and if, you, if you've got any spare cash at the minute, I'll be trying to make sure you hold on to it as best you can. But as I've said, there's advice there. Uh, and uh, I... I Make use of it because the market will turn again. That's the way pigs are. Uh, thanks very much for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mick. Lovely. Um, there we go. Fab. Thanks, Mick. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of to take in and to, to uh, digest there. Um, one of the main messages that I'm taking away really is um, how important it is uh, to put, prepare ourselves and our businesses for the possible conditions that you described, um, both to prepare for the challenges and the possible opportunities as well. Um, and like you mentioned, uh, the Mentored More Company project is here to help businesses. Um, we're uh, RDP, a Welsh Government funded project set up to support and develop the pig sector in Wales. So please, you know, get in touch with us and take advantage of the support that we've got available uh, for you. Um, very briefly, before we move on to the Q&A, I can see a few questions have already come in. Um, there's still time if you'd like to submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, but before we just move on to that, I'd like just to um, mention some of the uh, support or activities that we're doing as a project that might be of interest to you. Um, firstly, um, so obviously business profitability um, is, you know, influenced heavily by herd performance and making sure your herd is performing well is critical and adopting a more uh, proactive approach to disease prevention is centre to this. And a fundamental tool to be able to do this is a herd health plan. So um, Mentor More Cymru uh, does provide funding and grants towards developing a veterinary herd health plan. So if you don't have one um, in place already, please get in touch with us um, and we can work with you to get one of those set up um, and to fund that for you as well. Um, we also have a load of information 
um, and advice provided by experts on a range of topics that are on, available on our resource hub on the Mental Health More Cymru website. So again, um, please you know, familiarise yourself with that wealth of information that's there um, in uh, videos, booklets, fact sheets, um, and, and other uh, articles and materials. Um, and we also do provide um, uh, market development support. So Mick mentioned, you know, the opportunity of promoting yourself locally. Um, we provide funding and grants towards developing uh, your own branded materials. Um, and we can also provide free uh, point of sale materials as well to you. So um, yeah, get in touch with us. There's more information on the website, um, but you know, get in touch and have a chat with us directly to find out how you can uh, make the most of the support available. And uh, yeah, so now we're going to go on to the Q&A. Um, so as I mentioned, we've had a few come in already. So Mick, uh, just to start off, um, you mentioned the importance of a price premium, but looking at the graph, um, there have been times when our prices have been at or below the EU. How confident are you that we can maintain this premium? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, history will say that, uh, that if you look at it, we can. Um, just to be absolutely clear, I think I said it at the end, I'm not sure we can maintain it at, at 30 pence a kilo. Uh, that, that's a lot, uh, and particularly when we have a lot of pressure. But certainly over the years, we've shown that we can maintain a premium of 15 to 20 pence a kilo. Now, the reason for the, um, the slightly differing trends is what we tend to see is that EU prices might uh, are much more volatile. So when they go up, they go up quicker. And that drags our market with us. But when they fall, ours falls much more slowly. And, and the reason is associated, I think, as I said, with, with the way in which we, we price pigs in this country as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. But particularly over this, this last year with the, with the emphasis on retail, I think that's actually helped quite a lot. And I think going forward, that, that's the one thing that will, that will help to maintain the premium, albeit at a, potentially a slightly lower level than we've got at the moment. Brilliant, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question has come in. Um, I sell direct to the consumer um, and through local retail outlets. We've seen the local market boom recently. Do you think this is here to stay? <laughs> um, I think it is certainly for um, certainly for the for the short term, and by that I mean months, uh, and and probably even for the next year or two. Um, this uh, the sort of concentration more on local is is something that I think that. That can be exploited. Uh, there's an interest in it, uh, and I think it's a question of, of out of necessity, people have kind of gone back to, to shopping at retail and aren't shopping down the pub or going out for a meal. And and there's an opportunity there to tell the story because you're dealing with with the with the consumer either directly or you, or through marketing material to do that. Whereas if you go down the pub, people or go to a restaurant. Yeah, some people are interested in reading where it comes from. Generally, people are going out for a good time and don't get kind of that involved with it. So, yeah, I think I think it is an opportunity, but it's one, it won't just stay there on its own. I think it's got to be worked out. Brilliant. Thanks, Mick. And just to add to that, um, obviously, as I mentioned, there's uh, funding available for businesses to um, be, help them tell their story and get their brand out there. So get in touch with us and um, we can put you in touch with the designer and, um, and fund some branded materials to help you get your messages out there. Um, another question that's come in, um, you mentioned um, ASF. Should we be worried about it entering the UK? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, many of us were, have been saying, a lot of people have been saying that the spread of ASF into Germany was always a question of, of when, uh, not if. Um, and, and whilst the spread is likely to be relatively slow because of all the, the control measures that have been put in place, the risk is there uh, and, and it's a substantial one. We've seen it particularly in places like Poland, where it's and, and Hungary, where it's jumped over a, a relatively large distance. And I think the accepted wisdom is the vector in, in most of those circumstances has been people rather than the movement of, of, of animals. And that's one thing we have to be extremely vigilant over. So actually maintaining some control at our borders, which if there's one thing that comes out of Brexit, we've, we've probably got that. 
we really need to step that up. Um, we've already seen the kind of impact that, uh, that, that it's had on the German market. Uh, as I've said, prices you, with sales are over 50% lower. Their finished pig price is down by around about 35% year on year. Uh, and it's because the loss of value that you actually get from the market, particularly in things like offals, where you know everything from pig's ears to pig's tails and pretty much everything in between has a value if you can export it into places like China. If you can't, it doesn't. And I'm afraid that value just comes straight out of producers' pockets. So we need to... Uh, we need to be vigilant, and and I'd say the government probably needs to invest uh, in trying to maintain the biosecurity, of, of, of particularly at our borders. Brilliant, thanks. Um, yeah, it was interesting that a few of my colleagues. Oh, there's a bit of sound coming back. Uh, a few of my colleagues were talking to um, Richard Meller, who was speaking this evening at half seven. Um, he's our last session for our conference and um, he's an award-winning uh, pig producer in Norfolk and he was saying how you know he's really strict on biosecurity and you know um, and, and he, he's located next to a, a, a busy road so he had double fences and he mentioned the risk of you know someone could chuck a ham sandwich out of their window as they're passing and the implications on that uh, could be catastrophic. So, you know, it's, it, I think it is uh, a real risk and, you know, concern that, you know, and we can em implement measures ourselves to try and alleviate that as much as we possibly can, um, as well as uh, other people and other organizations um, helping with that. Thanks yeah. for that. I mean, just two points on that. One is, is it is a, it, it's a major, major issue. And for those of us that are old enough, if you remember classical swine fever, that hit in um, East Anglia uh, back in the, at the turn of the, uh, of the of the current century. What you've seen, it, what you saw there was uh, the most likely vector for that was a was a discarded ham sandwich into mm -hmm. an pig unit. Um, the other thing, and I think we've um, uh, we probably all have benefited from it, is I think the general population knows more about biosecurity now than it did uh, even a year ago because of all the discussion around it uh, because of of, of COVID. And um, I think hopefully uh, when, we, when we talk as an industry about biosecurity and the need to be careful uh, about our interaction with animals, then it, it, it's, it's an easier message to get across to the general public. Brilliant, thank you, Mick. Um, we've, we're having a load of questions in. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, you're really active uh, on the q and I don't think we'll be able to get through them all, but we'll try our best. Um, and if not, we'll try and uh, come back to you individually if we can. Um, to, to address your questions. Another one that's come in is, um, are China likely to consider imports from the UK now that we are out of the EU? Oh, I don't think that'll make it, that shouldn't make a difference. Um, the, uh, we already export to, to China uh, and we, we've been doing that for, for a good number of years. Um, just from a bureaucratic point of view, um, the relationships, the, the trading relationships on exports we're all negotiated on an individual member state basis. So uh, I was involved in, in back in the day in, in, well, we eventually landed it in 2011, but we started in 2004. But that was a discussion directly between UK government and the Chinese government. The same doesn't apply when we import uh, because the, the imports used to be dealt with by the EU. It was one of those strange things. So nothing should have changed other than the certificates now say, uh, that this is all produced in compliance with UK law rather than EU law. So I don't think there's a problem. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, another question, I'm sure we can fit it in. Um, do you think the COVID assurances on pig products will be expected in the UK market moving forward? Uh, no, uh, is, is the short answer to that. And I have to say, without getting into a very, very long uh, conversation about it, uh, all the accepted science thus far is that you can't transmit uh, COVID, certainly you can't transmit COVID uh, on packaging. Um, you can probably find traces of it, uh, but there's not enough there to actually uh, cause disease. That's the accepted amount. The Chinese are concerned because they've had some outbreaks of, of COVID in their ports, uh, in port cities, 
and they have uh, drawn a conclusion themselves that it's come through packaging of imported products. Uh, there will be research to be done, but I doubt whether it's going to show anything. But certainly the accepted science at the moment is that you can't get it through packaging, so there shouldn't be any need to, to have that level of certification. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think we've got time for at least one question. Um, so let's go with this one. So um, it's hard to believe that China will recover pork production that quickly. How reliable are the figures? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, very good question. Um, uh, as somebody who looks at this this kind of stuff on a regular basis, um, what we saw was a, a reduction in, in pork output, um, as I've said, over two years of very dramatic levels, you know, 14, 15 million tons maybe. Um, I think everybody, and, and I'd probably put me in there as well, said, oh, this is going to take ages for them to actually recover. Uh, but the Chinese don't work like that. It's a kind of command economy. And... Uh, just to give you some idea, in 2020, I think most forecasters were looking at a year-on-year -year drop in 2020 of around about 10 to 15 percent. As it turns out, it looks like it might be three or four percent at the very max. Um, so, yeah, you have to, you always have to take Chinese figures with a, a bit of a pinch of salt uh, because they don't, they don't produce them in quite the same way as, as we do, uh, and there are occasionally ulterior motives behind the, the data. But I think in this particular case, it's it's clear that they will recover. Um, it's the pace of the recovery we just need to, to maintain. But I think the general issue of, as you've seen, those buildings going up for, for people like Muyuan, they're not fictitious. That that's happening, and uh, you know, and and it's happening across China. Maybe not on quite the same scale, but it's certainly happening across China. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that answer, Mick.